Watchmen is by far the most complex comic ever made. Does that mean it's the best? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder. But what you can't argue about is whether Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons really put their all into making this 12-issue maxi-series. It's almost like they were offered an unprecedented level of creative freedom and they were told that they could own their own work. You know, like in most forms of publishing. And then, well, everything went wrong. That is a bummer. I'm Dave Baker. Today on Total Nerd, we're going to explain how Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons came up with The Watchmen, why they put so much effort into it, and then how they got screwed. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel. Oh, and uh, leave a comment too. Let us know what Total Nerd topics you would like us to explain next. Watchmen has become one of, if not the, most important comics in the Western canon. That's due almost completely to the two men who created it. Alan Moore was born on November 18, 1953 in Northampton, England. He grew up in a very poor area without much access to books. Nevertheless, he became obsessed with writing as a young man and began to publish poetry and prose essays in a zine he self-published called Embryo. Ooh, look at this cutie! Love those bangs, young Alan Moore! Dave Gibbons was born on April 14th in 1949 in London, England. His father was a town planner and his mother was a secretary. Struggling to break into the comic book industry initially, he worked as a building surveyor. Eventually, he managed to find work as a letterer for IPC Media, and then eventually transitioned into writing and drawing his own strips. Oh, a young Dave Gibbons! It's like 90s Superman mullet, except make it Gibbons. The early 80s saw what is now referred to as the British Invasion. Garth Ennis, Grant Morrison, Alan Moore, Pat Mills, Neil Gaiman, Mark Miller, all highly acclaimed writers from the UK were hired by DC to write books. The explosion of talent and ideas heralded a changing of the standards and status quo that honestly is still being felt to this day. These writers employed more literary executions and told deeply personal stories that marked a distinct transition from the God, we wish it was still the Silver Age style of writing that Bronze Age writers like Roy Thomas and Marv Wolfman and Len Wein utilized. In 1983, Len Wein hired Alan Moore to write Swamp Thing, which is often pointed to as a key turning point, not only in Moore's career, but in the history of mainstream comics. The previous run concluded with Swamp Thing's human form, Alec Holland, being killed. The twist that Alan Moore instituted being Alec Holland was never actually alive. Swamp Thing was, in fact, always a living swamp who just thought he was a human. Having written a few very well-received projects for DC, Moore submitted an unsolicited pitch for a new project. In 1983, DC acquired the Bat Catalog to the Charlton characters. The pitch would involve a darker reimagining of these Charlton characters and a murder mystery plot. The characters that Moore would originally include were Peacemaker, The Question, Blue Beetle, Peter Can and Thunderbolt, Nightshade, and Captain Atom. DC's editor-in-chief, the much-beloved inker Dick Giordano, suggested that Moore create new characters because, well, they just spent a bunch of money on all these characters and Alan Moore wanted to either either kill them or, you know, render them useless. Moore then restructured the pitch to make the characters unique and not infringe on DC's previous treasure trove of Ditko created superheroes. For historical context, the people working in the comic book industry at the time weren't too happy with how they were being treated. They were organizing and they were having discussions about unionizing. Some people had even gone as far as to intimate that the reason that DC went across the pond and started courting British talent was to squash this uprising of industry professionals. However, ownership was the talk of the day. Everybody wanted to own their work. The indie companies like Aircel, Kamiko, and Pacific were leading the way. This allowed creators at bigger companies negotiating leverage. When asked about the ownership issue at the time of publication at San Diego Comic-Con, Moore said, the way it works, as I understand it, is that DC owns it for the time being they're publishing it, and then it reverts to Dave and me and we can make all the money off of the Slurpee Cups. Only problem is, he didn't really understand how it worked. We'll come back to this. As previously mentioned, Watchmen is one of the most complex comics ever created. From its recurring visual motifs, to its exceedingly impressive display of the elasticity of the nine panel grid, to the idea that every piece of the comic should be a storytelling device. Watchmen fundamentally altered the way Americans look at comics as a medium. Moore and Gibbons took the tropes and schema of the traditional big two superhero story and infused it with gravitas, humanity, and honestly, logic. They applied a gritty realism to the vigilante aesthetics that burst every preconceived notion of what comics as a medium was previously capable of. Upon its release, the book achieved widespread acclaim, so much so that it eventually ended up on Time Magazine's 100 Greatest Novels. Not comics, just books, period. It's the only comic to be included on the list. The impact that it had on the industry as a whole was almost instant. Along with the works of Howard Chaikin and Frank Miller, the tropes, storytelling devices, and general grittiness proved to be very influential on an entire generation of creators. 
DC had told Moore that they wouldn't be making money off of the Watchmen merchandise. It wasn't in the contract, but it was a gentleman's agreement with Dick Giordano. However, when the book was released, DC started selling button sets, meaning the iconic smiley face and other Watchmen related buttons. When he discovered that they were selling these buttons, Moore was furious, feeling like he had been lied to. DC claimed that they weren't merchandise, but instead promotional pieces. They were eventually able to come to a common ground, but Moore remained suspicious of DC overall. Unbeknownst to Alan Moore, DC was putting together a Watchmen role-playing game. Yes, that's right, you can still find them. Have you ever yearned to be a chaotic, bean-eating, neoconservative detective? An omniscient, always-nude watchmaker? DC wanted to fulfill your desires. Only problem is that they didn't tell Alan Moore. Oh boy. Yeah, that's right. DC and Mayfair Games didn't clue Moore or Gibbons into the fact that they were producing these games, which obviously rubbed Moore the wrong way. They were able to talk him down and regain his confidence, thankfully, and Moore worked with Mayfair and DC to make sure that the gaming modules of Who Watches the Watchmen and Taking Out the Trash were in line with the Watchmen canon. Here's where things take the downward turn that you've been waiting for this whole time. Okay, so Moore and Gibbons poured their hearts into making this thing, they changed the medium, they bled onto the pages, and pushing the form to new heights. You'd think that they would have been taken care of, right? You know, treated with respect? Well, that's not exactly, uh, you know, how it ended up working out. The DC contract for Watchmen stipulated that DC would own the rights to the Watchmen while it was in print, and then when it went out of print, the rights, after a year, would revert to Moore and Gibbons. This sounds like a fair deal, right? It's not like anyone else is going to make new Watchmen comics. And single issue comics don't stay in print. They just come out, and then maybe they get reprinted once, and then they go away. Oh, but uh, but wait, Watchmen is the highest selling and most critically acclaimed comic of a generation. And it was pretty much reprinted as a collection or a trade or a graphic novel or whatever you want to call it, like instantly. And those don't go out of print, ever. When asked about how he felt in a 2006 New York Times interview, he replied, I said, fair enough. You have managed to successfully swindle me, so I will never work for you again. Which is honestly a shame. Adapting Watchmen is something that many people have tried to do over and over again. From Terry Gilliam to Batman screenwriter Sam Hamm, many creative people have tried to crack the nut of bringing the Watchmen to the big screen. Some of them have even had Alan Moore's blessing. Very few of them, but you know, some of them. When Gilliam was involved, Moore signed over the option rights, A, because he was curious to see what an auteur filmmaker would do with his material, and B, money. Mostly because money. Moore and Gibbons signed re-optioning papers a few times over the years because they naively thought the film would literally never get made. Things got so ludicrous in the various drafts of Watchmen that one of them even climaxed with the comedian and other superheroes coming to our literal world and fighting on top of the Statue of Liberty? Part of me is thankful that I never had to see that, and uh, part of me really is depressed that I never got to see that. As a bonus, check out some of this test footage from screenwriter David Hayter in 2004 when he was vying to direct The Watchmen. Mm. This little stain, is that bean juice? <gasps> That's right, human bean juice. By the early 90s, Alan Moore didn't want anything to do with DC. He wouldn't take their calls and wouldn't even take money from them that wasn't directly derived from already in print works. Gibbons, well, he was less rigid. He seems like he's a genuinely easygoing type of guy, and he continued to write and draw stuff for DC basically up until now. Don't worry about Alan Moore, though. He didn't end up destitute or anything, he just found a new home at Image Comics, the biggest publisher of the 90s, doing runs on Supreme and Wildcats, and even writing some Spawn. Hey, Spawn. Were those books uh, as good as Watchmen? No, but they definitely did pay the bills. While working for Image, Moore and Jim Lee struck up a friendship. In fact, after the initial gold rush period of Image, Lee approached Moore about writing his own book for Wildstorm. That book was League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which would later balloon into Alan Moore's own dedicated imprint. America's Best Comics launched with great fanfare and much critical acclaim. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was the standout of these books and would later be adapted into a movie as well, uh, you know, that was pretty subpar. By the mid to late 90s, everyone was aware of how much impact Watchmen was having on the state of comics. Practically every comic being produced was this, but make it Watchmen style. DC reached out to Moore asking him to write a sequel book. He didn't want to. They reached out again and were like, we will literally give you the rights to Watchmen back. 
just please write Watchmen 2? He still said no. The book was always intended to be a standalone work. He wanted nothing to do with DC. From his perspective, they'd burned him before, they wouldn't do it again. And then the bottom fell out of the comics market. The speculator boom in the 90s crashed and sales for everything cratered. Wildstorm tried to diversify their line. They got into trading cards and even sold a bunch of weird swimsuit and lingerie pinup books in order just to keep the lights on. But ultimately, Jim Lee was offered a deal that he couldn't pass up. And Wildstorm sold to DC Comics, which obviously made Alan Moore very happy. Initially, he contemplated quitting all the titles, but decided to stay after he had a conversation with Lee where he was promised that none of his checks would come from DC. They would be coming from a separate bank account. And also, no one from DC would ever have any contact with him ever. Moore wrapped up his America's Best Comics line, finished the stories he was telling, and then left Wildstorm to pursue other works. Because of how the deal was originally structured, Moore managed to finagle ownership of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but everything else would now be owned by DC. In 2009, The Watchmen would finally make it to the big screen, directed by Zack Snyder. Ugh. The film was released to mixed critical reviews and middling box office. With a budget of $138 million, it only grossed $185 million. Hmm. Some criticism has been levied against the film that it's too devoted to its original source material, in many ways failing to breathe new life into scenes because it's fastidious dedication to the panel by panel recreation. Others have maligned the fact that while Moore was commenting on the objectivist overtones in so many superhero stories, Snyder was exalting them, missing the point that deconstructing these themes was satirizing them, not perpetuating them. Ultimately, I think we can all agree that the opening credits, uh, that's the best part of the movie. That slow mo -do. Having been burned by DC numerous times now, Moore wanted nothing to do with the film. Even though he had signed the option years ago, he wanted his name taken off the credits and refused any money that was due in residuals, opting instead to pass that along to Dave Gibbons, asking only that Gibbons say thank you. Isn't that so sweet of him? Ultimately, Moore felt that Gibbons didn't say thank you quickly enough, and the two men had a falling out. This is basically the same situation that happened with the V for Vendetta movie. However, David Lloyd did say thank you quickly enough, and, uh, you know, Alan Moore's arbitrary timeline of thanks was met, and the men are still friends. Ah, oh, man, being homies with Alan Moore, it sounds exhausting. Many efforts have been made by DC over the years to make Watchmen merchandise. However, they were stopped by Moore or by various legal entities who didn't want to deal with the public backlash of Moore's fans. These DC Direct toys were almost produced to celebrate the 15th anniversary of Watchmen in 2001. They've only ever been shown once at San Diego Comic Con in 2000. However, when the movie was released, the floodgates were opened. Have you ever wanted a Watchmen shirt? Or a toy? Or a beanie? Or a prequel video game written by Len Wein? Or a button set? Or a hoodie? Or a mug? Or a lunchbox? for a wallet or another t-shirt or another beanie or a beanie shaped like Rorschach's mask or some Funko Pops. Now, you get your heart's desire. Paul Levitz was the publisher of DC Comics from 2002 to 2009. Under his watch, there was a never quite official doctrine that certain lines were never to be crossed. He was very vocal about the fact that the only way that there would ever be a Watchmen sequel comic is if Alan Moore made it. And then in 2009, Paul Levitz left DC. And then in 2012, we got... Before Watchmen. Before Watchmen is a series of books that DC published telling stories that happened before Watchmen. Purportedly, Gibbons was paid over $250,000 to just endorse the release of these prequels. Moore was courted, and well, as you'd expect, he turned down the money. The books feature a killer lineup of creators. Darwin Cook, Brian Azzarello, J. Michael Straczynski, Lee Bermejo, J.G. Jones, Adam Hughes, many other very talented creators. And eventually they came out, and some people liked them, and other people didn't. Oh look! more depressing things. Remember how DC had Moore and Gibbons make this book under the auspices that the creators would own it and that because of that they created a, you know, genre and medium defining work? Yeah, but that's that's lame, right? Like, don't we just want to see Dr. Manhattan and Superman punch each other? That shit's cool. Well, that's what DC and Jeff Johns are doing right now in the thrilling new maxi series Doomsday Clock. Pick it up wherever comics are so Oh god, it just keeps going. <laughs> no. No, that's the literally that's the line. Oh god, it keeps going. Oh, <laughs>
And now we arrive at Damon Lindelof's new HBO series, Watchmen, the remix of the classic story that you've always loved and respected. I don't know. When he was asked about his thoughts about what Alan Moore's disapproval meant, Lindelof said, I admire Alan Moore. Alan Moore is a genius. He's made it clear that he doesn't want any association or affiliation with Watchmen. I admire Alan Moore's punk rock spirit. Back in the day, if he was told he couldn't do something, he'd be like, f you, I'm gonna do it anyway. So I'm channeling Alan Moore. I'm saying, f you, I'm doing it anyway. Which is just, I don't know. This is all just so sad. Alan Moore recently said that he's retiring from the comics industry. He said for years that he'd retire once the final League of Extraordinary Gentlemen issue was released. And it has been. So now he's done, supposedly. I kind of don't buy it. You know, the whole, I'm done, I'm bored, I'm gonna go make some more stuff. I just don't really see him retiring. It's more like he just needs a nap. You know, like he needs a nap tirement. I get it, the comics industry has been terrible to him, but also, what's he gonna do? Write another, like, extremely long, incomprehensible, dense novel? Yeah, that's actually probably exactly what he'll do. Or not, because comics. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. To sum it up, Watchmen is a towering work. You can not like it, you can love it, but you have to respect its place in the history of comics. The fact that the contractual disputes and bad blood between everybody involved continues is just a shame. Imagine what would have happened if Warren Gibbons had either been treated a little bit better or had, you know, a goddamn lawyer to look over the contract. Who knows what great works of art we would have gotten if everyone hadn't been just, you know, complete dicks to each other. Well, what do you think? Will we ever get a book with the cultural importance of Watchmen again? Will you be watching the new show now that you know how messy things are behind the scenes? Are you going to be running out to buy the new issue of Doomsday Clock? If you liked this video, please comment below and let us know what areas of nerd culture need an explainer. In the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.